Hello and welcome to the Watercolour Challenge video. I'm Mike Chaplin and together with my art expert colleagues Susan Webb and Kurt Jackson, we'll be sharing some of the tricks of the trade with you, our fellow watercolour painters. Coming up you'll find several tips from last year's series and I'll be throwing in a few of my own as well. And where better to start than with the materials you'll need to create your painting. I'm going to take you to Turkey Mill, one of my favourite painting places. And because I've only got an hour, I'm going to take the bare minimum of equipment with me. Just what's suitable for painting out of doors on a day like this. So, first of all, brushes. We can't get by without layers. Box of paints. Sketchbook. We need paper with us, certainly. And a selection of drawing materials. I've got charcoal, a felt-tip pen, uh, a very soft pencil, and a sponge and a rubber. And last, but by no means least, plenty of clean water. When choosing watercolour paper, it's important to understand the difference in the texture of these surfaces and what it will do to the paint. I've chosen to take out with me today a rough one, but let us have a look and see what happens when I pass the brush over the smooth, the toned and the roughed one. So a quick stroke like that will reveal that we get a very sharp, defined edge on the smooth one, ideal for detailed painting. On the tone one, it's broken down somewhat, and it certainly changed the colour, the mixture of the tone against that purple. And on the rough one, it's broken down and added a sparkle, which I think might be quite suitable for the sparkly light we're going to encounter on the water today. And you don't need a huge selection of brushes either. What you need is good quality. And what I've got here are a couple which look very, very similar. This one is sable, probably the best hair you can get. This one is of unknown origin and unknown hair, so let's just try them. I suspect that this one, which I don't know the origin of, doesn't seem to have a great deal of resilience. It's, it's bending, it's not, fling, not coming straight back to shape. If I do the same thing with the sable, I'm going to find that I can wave thin lines, come back, and it will come immediately back up to a point for me. And talking of good value for money, my favourite brush, an old shaving brush, which I've had for years, ideal for laying huge, quick washes. And it's a similar story with paints. Cheap ones that you see down the market may look very good, the colours are nice and bright, but there's a lot of filler in there, often chalk, just to give you bulk, and they will fade in time. So spend as much as you can afford on a few good quality paints and forget these very cheap ones. You may remember from the programme that we made at Chatsworth that I showed you how to make your own paint. I'm trying to save us all some money and try to give us a little bit of flexibility in the way that we can equip ourselves with watercolour. So I've started making some colour here. Mm. Now, basically, using pigment, it's a question of what you mix it is, with is what it becomes. Mm. I'm using various things to make it into watercolour. I could use oils or I could use varnishes to turn it into oil paint or printing inks. So, in other words, that, well, you wouldn't have to buy three different kinds of paint. You could use, use the pigment and mix it with the things uh, that you absolutely. mentioned. Absolutely. I use it for etching inks at home. And it suddenly occurred to me that I've got all the stuff there to make watercolour. So, gum arabic is the first thing to mix in. It attracts water. All good quality paints have a large degree of gum arabic in. Mm -hmm. Glycerin, just to give it a little bit of body and slip. Ox gall, from the stomach lining of a cow, which is a wetting agent, which makes it flow well. Mystery ingredient, a bit of honey to give it some viscosity. A mm -hmm. couple of drops of vinegar just so it doesn't um, go off and go mouldy. These are mixed together with a knife first of all and a little bit more pigment than this normally and then ground with a pestle normally on a slab of marble. Yeah. When I've finished I can hear there's no grittiness then this is taken off with a knife and put in a pot like this. Right. So this is great. I can get a big brush in there. For me that's wonderful not to be faffing around with little, little bits and pieces.
Turkey Mill, one of my favourite locations. I've sketched and painted hundreds of scenes here over the years. It was at this old factory that the Watman family made their fortune making paper, used by artists such as Constable, Gainsborough and William Blake. Even when I'm somewhere as familiar as this, a place I've visited many times before, I like to try and get a feel for the composition as if it's the sort of first time I've ever been here. And to do that, I'm working very directly in the sketchbook, doing what I call an energy sketch with strong, solid materials like charcoal and a sketchbook and working very, very fast. So let's have a look and see how this goes. I'm really going to work away putting in the very strong tonal elements of this. I'm not particularly worried about um, the, the, the huge detail on it, but what I'm trying to do is get that sort of sense of vitality and movement, finding my way into the composition. Lovely wall with the light just lipping along the top of it there. Really interesting. We're looking here at um, the tools that artists use, tones, lines, the linear composition, where things are happening. So very dark composition there, and right bang in the middle of it, and slightly off centre where I'm looking, is this lovely, elegant little boathouse. A little bit of hard geometry within this energetic tone of these trees, and that lovely little glints of light on the paper. So this is normally how I start. My fellow art expert, Susan Webb, has other useful ways to help you plan your picture. At Navan Fort in Amar, Susan showed Hannah how to use tone studies. The idea behind a tone study is to help you with the development of the painting of your watercolour. Tone studies are done in black and white. Tone is really varying degrees of light and dark in a colour. So the first thing is to position your dark and your light colours. Okay. Now I'm putting darks here, but I don't want these darks to be isolated. I want them to lead the eye around the painting, to make movement through the painting. And that really helps the eye to move around the picture. I always like to start with placing both my darkest darks and my lightest lights. Now in this one, I'm making this my darkest dark, and the tree is the lightest light. Now, as I've placed the two extreme colours, I work out from them with varying degrees of half-tone. So you see these are less dark. Mm -hmm. And this is moving the eye again around the painting. You've actually now, chosen exactly the same subjects in both cases, that's, but it's a completely different That's treatment. right, just to show that the two different ways of treating it will give two completely different moods. Now, yeah. ideally, I suggest you make a number of these before you begin, mm -hmm. um, because it helps to sort your mind out, to get rid of any doubt or hesitation, mm. and then to select the one that you feel captures the mood that you want to convey best. And at Glenda Loch, in Susan's home county of Wicklow, she looked at the subject in terms of the shapes in the composition. All natural form can be reduced to three basic shapes, circles, rectangles or triangles. So what I'm doing is I'm breaking this, this space up, which is um, my composition for my painting, into some very simple shapes. I start by putting a line for my horizon, which in this case is just below the middle line. You can have either just below or just above. Why have you put it below in this case? Because there's quite a lot happening here above it with buildings and mountains and bushes and things. Then divide up the remaining spaces using your rectangles, your triangles and your circles, making interesting shapes in between them. If you look at these buildings here, this is the Ryan Tower. It's a rectangle with a triangle on top. The ruins of the tower below is another triangle. The bushes here are little bits of circles. The big bush in the front here is a big circle. The rock here is a big rectangle. Mm. Now, another very useful compositional device is to use a diagonal lead-in. And this is your diagonal lead-in here. You see how your eye's drawn up the edge of this bank? Mm. Along here, up through the dividing line of the field to what we call the focal point, which is this little church. And that being the thing that you particularly want to define. That's right. We really want us to look at this tower because this is my main area of interest and then I make all my strong contrasts of light and dark and colour around this area. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Those were two very good pieces of advice from Susan but sometimes you don't have the time to make such detailed studies. That's where the tip on thumbnail sketches which she gave at Levens Hall in the Lake District 
comes into its own. Begin by dividing your paper into units and think of shape and think of space. Mm -hmm. Try different arrangements, try different alternatives. Here I have one with a large sky, here I'm doing one with a small sky. It's very useful, it saves an awful lot of time. If you start your watercolour and decide you've got your tree in the wrong place, it really is very frustrating. Thank you. So we've got the drawing, where do we go from here? Well, what we want to do is enlarge this drawing up, but not lose the proportions of it. So probably the easiest way is to imagine a diagonal line drawn from bottom left up through that top right hand corner. So let's just produce this line up here. And if we then take a line up vertically from this edge and a line horizontally from this edge, we find that any line that we draw going from left to right across to that diagonal and then dropping down to the baseline gives us a proportion and a rectangle exactly the same as the original drawing. It's not much of a step from there to quarter this drawing up, or as many as divisions as you feel you need. Do the same sort of divisions on the, on the space you're going to work in. And then very quickly have a look and see where those various objects appear within that quarter drawing. So we're not only enlarging the whole drawing in proportion, but we're making sure that the things have the right proportion to each other, so we're not compressing, we're not expanding. So here's another really useful tip to help you capture the mood of the place. So what I've got to do is put down this pencil, pick up a very simple felt tip pen, and it's a water-soluble one, and a little sketch, which I'll just put a few more little marks on here just to finish off. And the point being that because this is water-soluble, I can not only capture the line texture of the trees with this pen, but if I then swap to go to a brush, a little bit of water, and I find by flooding over like this, I can actually pick up that texture and use that to paint and make marks about tone. So it's a very useful aid when I'm back in the studio to remind me about where the light was coming from and the general weight of the picture. That's probably enough about preliminary studies. We've found our way into the subject matter, but what about that really nerve-wracking moment when you're faced with that really big white bit of paper? So there's all sorts of gadgets to help you see and compose, but probably the cheapest is right at the end of your fingertips. By taking your hands like this and making a, a box, you can compose and see the format that you want to work to. And more than likely, you're going to want to do some measuring within that format. So picking up a simple pencil and taking off one measurement, which I shall take the width of that building, helps me find my way across the composition. But we've still got this problem of this huge bit of white paper. So let's have a look at a tip I came up with at Kerber Edge in the Peak District, which helps us get through this problem of drawing and observation, plus a couple more. A way that suits me, which is to get the feel of the paper by first of all just drawing with my finger, not putting any marks down, working down that edge, and I'm doing the same little calculations that I would do as if I were drawing with pencil or charcoal or a brush. I'm measuring from point to point, mm. looking at um, relationships of distances. I'm looking at some of the textures of those little dots of trees there, and I'm touching the paper where I think they're going to go. It gives me the feel of the space I'm working in, mm -hmm. the proportion I'm working in. And when I feel that I can almost see where the picture's going to be on there, I'll pick up one of these little bit of charcoal. So you're yeah, actually I following what you, what you did with your fingers? I'm following exactly the same line, but I, I feel I've been there before. I, mm. I, I know where I'm going on this rather difficult journey down this long line. I'll often touch the objects. If I'm drawing this head, I, I'll want to know whether it's dry or wet, um, whether it's sharp, whether, whether it's soft. Mm. You, you, you make a relationship with your subject matter, but you also need to make a relationship with your materials and the compromise between what's in your brain and I will often work with a 
full arm like this. So there's a very direct link from the brain mm. through the arm to the point of contact. It's not a remote object. It makes you much bolder, doesn't it, using the whole arm? I mean, I know this is a thing you talk about a lot, and it's obviously very important uh, to you, and that it makes you... you well, it, it sort of releases the poet in you, I suppose, which is... Well, that's no bad thing. From a very windy Derbyshire to a warm and sunny Port Merion, which really did look like an Italian village the day that we were there. I brought a sheet of glass with me. Most people when they're drawing, if they don't th think about it, draw either too small or too large. Right. So what I'm doing is drawing on this bit of glass and I'm actually drawing these buildings, what is known as a term of sight size, it's the size that I actually see it. Now this bit of glass represents my drawing paper. Mm. So this is not, a, not something you'd normally do, but it's just to make the point that if you draw it the size you see it, there's a lot less room for discrepancies in the drawing. Mm. I think it's almost time if we lay this down on this bit of paper, we'll probably see what we've got now. Okay. I'll just go around that area and let's see. Let's lay this down and see. Right. All right. Now that's a sight size drawing. Mm. This is the size that I would instinctively tend to draw on the paper. Yes. And it's quite easy because I can just see where the points are and mm. virtually get them in a row. Oh, that's very good. OK. Thank you very much. Pleasure. For some subjects, like aeroplanes, your drawing needs to be precisely right or else the subject just won't look workable. At Headcorn Airdrome, I tackled a helicopter. What I'm going to do is draw in front of me along the bottom of that hedge when I meet the aeroplane, I'm going to come down at the angle that it develops at. We're just going past the roundel here, two circles there. Mm -hmm. That shape carries on down, a little kick in there, round the belly of the plane coming down here, and we suddenly got to the strut for the wheels. Round the spring, down the strut, and we're now at the wheel. And that's hopefully quite accurate. Right. But if you want to check it, there's a very simple very cheap tool that you can actually make for yourself and it's called an angle finder. Okay. You need two bits of card mm -hmm. or thick paper and something to hold it at the bottom. And we can use this if we hold it vertically and I'm going to check that angle in there and I'm going to swing the paper around, one eye closed makes it a lot easier, until I've actually captured that angle in this shape. I should then, when I'm happy with it, be able to bring it down and lay it on that shape there so it matches completely. You will see the little angle in there. I'll draw on it and you can see how accurate we are. Got it in one. In one. So, that's the drawing tip. It's and hard work. You need to work at your drawing. Is it true that once you're used to it, or once you're used to drawing, then you won't need that anymore? You won't need that. That can go. <laughs> Well, while you've been away, I've been busy getting this drawing down, drawing it in paint so that it disappears off into the washes when I lay those. And I think I'm ready to do that now. Have you ever wondered why some people's paintings look really bright and vibrant, and other people's look really muddy? Well, the answer is lots of water, and more than one pot. So whenever I paint, I always have at least two pots of water absolutely full. One to mix the paint, and one to clean the brushes. While I get on with my wash, here are Susan Webb and Kurt Jackson with some more advice on water, washes, and what happens when you mix in paint. Tarn Howes in the Lake District was a perfect place for Susan to demonstrate how to plan your washes to capture reflections. You have to decide exactly where you're going to put your light and your dark tones. 
and um, once you've decided where they're going to go, you need to mix all the colours up ready ahead of time. Mm. And then you're ready to go in one big go without the washes drying in a strange way on you because mm. it's all ready, all prepared for you. So you need to prop your board at an angle of between 30 and 40 degrees to make sure the paint runs down the paper so that you don't get a sharp edge. Right. If you want to make your edge a little bit more precise to the, what you're reflecting, just lift a little bit with your tissue. Lift oh, it off. So it just comes off very easily. Mm. Okay. And okay. then you can take your brush, clean it out, um, put a little bit more of the warm colour onto it and brush over it. So my warm base is a yellow ochre base mm -hmm. and the um, cold base is a base of ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. Now the green will also be reflecting and, the, and if you just lay that down, you see, the mm -hmm. um, thing is to control the amount of water. The more water there is there, the more it will run. If it runs too much, use your tissue to lift it off. If it doesn't run quite enough, then uh, add a bit more water. Now, as the paint is drying there, I'm just mixing some slightly thicker paint, and these will be slightly darker reflections that um, go down into the water. And you see, this will bleed in. Watercolour is really a matter of controlled accident, and you want to be quite free with what you're doing. Now, you can play with that as much as you like. Now, the bit of water in the background is quite nice being light there. I might put a pale blue wash over it mm. afterwards. The most important thing is to leave it at that angle to dry. Do not change the angle while it's drying. At Sandy Cove, near Dublin, beside the James Joyce Tower, Susan showed another use for clean water. I'm going to show you today a blottesque technique. This is a technique using very, very wet paper. So now as I put the paint on, it just sort of flows. And, mm. and really, it's like playing with the paint. You let the mm. paint pretty much do what it wants. When you have an open area of water like this, you get lovely reflections in it. So where my um, light in the sky moves to the left, it moves to the right in the water. So you get this crisscross movement, which right. makes quite a nice pattern. Mm. So this is just an ultramarine blue. Now my third mixture is a mixture of ultramarine blue and light red. And these are the stormy bits. Remember that watercolour always dries lighter. So right. if, it, if it looks right at this stage, it's going to dry wrong. Yeah. That's simple as that, really. I'd like to have and a go at that myself. Yeah. Lovely. Play with it. Super. And in the tropical jungle of Treba Garden, the Cornish artist Kurt Jackson showed how to use layers of washes to create the light and shade in foliage. So what I want to show you is a relatively simple method using classic watercolour technique of building up one wash on top of another wash. Mm. So first of all, laying down a simple light yellowy wash, leaving a little bit of white showing through. Once that's dried, you can work over it again with another wash, slightly darker, maybe slightly bluer. And by working over this and then leaving areas of the previous wash coming through. Choose your leaf form, in this case slightly almond shaped, maybe rhododendron leaves in this garden. Building this up, immediately you've got one layer showing through another. Yes. Now, once that dries, you can work on it again. And by putting continually slightly darker washes over other washes, you can build it up and give this feeling of these layers. Yes. It's also, you can uh, scrape back through. You can do this and then go like this, pull back through other leaves. Right. And this is a technique different from actually painting each leaf individually, is it? It means you don't have to methodically paint each leaf, which is a method I can't do and I know some people do it, but it just gives the feeling of lots and lots of leaves. Mm. But uh, it's, it works. You might build up 10, 20 layers. Yeah. All by different washes, one on top of but the it other. It gives that feeling of complexity sure. and depth. Yes, absolutely.
Well, I've tentatively laid in the first washes just to establish the composition, but they're already looking a little bit thin, but I'm quite happy with that. I now need to establish some sort of depth and some sort of presence to it. So to do this, what we need is a real firm understanding of tone and of colour. We all know the basic colours, red, yellow and blue, but the choice can sometimes seem completely bewildering faced with them all in the shop. Choice between pans or tubes. Um, to just to demystify them a bit, I think, remember, they're very simple pigment sometimes, nothing to be scared of. And just learning about them can completely transform your painting. When we were at Haddon Hall in Derbyshire, I introduced Hannah to colour charts. Um, we spent a lot of time putting colour down, but a lot of people aren't aware that you can quite easily lift colour back up from the page. Mm -hmm. One or two things we need to know, some colours stain, they're like dyes, other colours, the more organic pigments, don't stain. That information is all contained on colour charts and you just need to read through them to tell you which stain, which don't. So you mean the ones that don't stain that can be more easily dealt Much with? Much easier to lift those up, yeah. Let me just show you. With a wet brush, if I just reactivate that colour, wring the brush out and go over it again, I can bring that almost up to a pure white and it does produce a lovely soft edge. Mm. Most people would tend to reserve that edge with masking fluid and then rub it off, but it would be very hard, it would be jumping out. Yes. You can see how you can modulate very subtle tonal changes. In well, there. you're really still in charge of it rather yeah. than with the masking. And it doesn't have to be a brush. You can use a mask like this and just wipe across with a sponge and lift the whole lot out. Very lovely, elegant things happening. Yes. Or you can take less off much more subtly. A rather wonderful soft mm, things happen. Mm. Good. Lots of good advice, as always. And all that grey at Lechwed Slate Caverns in North Wales cried out for a tip about mixing greys. You talked about the difficulties of painting slate, all the different greys that you really want, mm -hmm. and that grey's not just black and white, but a variety of different colours. So uh, please illustrate. Well, light's a wonderful thing to play with. If you take a prison, if we had any sun here today, we would get a wonderful strip of rainbow across here. And if we could pick that up, bend it round there, we'd get what the artist calls a colour wheel. Mm. And it immediately reveals the opposites. Mix any of those together, you'll get what we call very subtle greys. And I'm going to show you with, first of all, the red and the green. It takes a minute or two to appear. You'll have to be patient with it for a second while this sort of comes up. And we don't really know what we're getting until I actually dilute that down. But you'll see immediately, here it comes, look. Yes. So it's just not what, it's what, not what you'd expect from that green and that red. Indeed not. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try it with two others. There's a blue. This is not an orange. I've gone slightly off the orange to a, a, a burnt sienna there. But you'll see... That produces a warmer yes, grey here, then. Here it comes, look, down there. Put it by the side of that one, and let's just mix these two together. Very much the sort of greys you'd get in industrial paintings. I've got a bit of slate here, look. It's very similar. It's that sort of colour, isn't it? Yes, it is. Perfect. And yet it it's not got that dead quality of black and white. The other thing is tone comes in as well. If you're working on a very broad tonal scale, choose two which contain at least one with a very dark tone to it. Mm, absolutely smashing it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Perhaps it was the Welsh weather, but tones of grey were also on my mind the day we painted the Menai Bridge. People tend to underpaint much too much tonally, so I've come up with an idea which is very simple. It's a piece of paper sprayed from black through the greys to white. You could equally well do it with a pencil. And the idea is you can actually look at tones, and I include colours in this, mm. to find out the tone of a colour. By holding it up and squinting at the subject, you can find at what point along this scale the edge blends in with the object. Right. And it's surprisingly dark when you have a look at it. Oh, yes. Much darker than you think they're going to be. Well, I think that's a very useful piece of paper for an artist. It's a cheap tool, isn't it? <laughs> it is indeed. Thank you very much, Mike.
And in Scotland, at Sweetheart Abbey, I came up with a tip that please only follow with due caution. What's this for? Um, it's a stone that I've just picked up from the wall behind us. Um, it's the same stone that the abbey is built of, and it's got this lovely little band of moss on it, and in fact contains all the colour elements that are in the landscape here. So is this one finished now, or have you still more to do? Could be finished there, all the information's there about the abbey. And it's, it's vibrant, there's a lot of tone going on, but I'm going to try one more thing, and that's putting a slash of yellow just across the painting just here, just, to bring, just to bring it to life. That's what you reckon will do? I think it will. How about oh. that? Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? So, Wonderful. tip for the day, keep your painting nice and loose and expressive if you can. It sums up the feel of the place. And take those little colour notes away with you just on that stone. Colour of the abbey, colour of the landscape. It's all there, ready to go back to the studio with. Just like that? Just like that. Please don't take away ancient monuments as mementos. Well, what we've got here is starting to shape up, but I think the lake needs a lot more work here, so I think it's time for a bit of creative thinking. The more I do watercolour, the more I appreciate its versatility and its flexibility, and indeed its difficulty. Just having a look at the lake here, I realise that I've overpainted a bit too much. I've managed to preserve one or two little lights in here, but I really need to add that little spark of light back in. Because I've used the rough paper purposefully to give that sort of vitality to it, I can just, using a bit of sandpaper, polish off the top of those areas and just put that little bit of sparkle back in. Look at those little whites just reappearing there. Kurt Jackson, a master of painting light on water, gave a lot of advice on putting colour down and taking it off at Kynance Cove. So I'm going to show a couple of techniques I've used which combine that water and the white of the page. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about painting the sea, the sea today has got beautiful light shining off it. The brightest white you can have is the white of the page. So one of the first things you need to do is decide where those areas of white are going to be. So you can literally just paint round them and leave areas of white to show through. I mean, some people use masking fluid like this, but mm -hmm. I've never done that. Mm -hmm. So you can do that. The other way is to bring the white out again. So uncover it. And to do that you need reasonably clean water. <laughs> this is a, a wash I put down earlier yeah. and by putting droplets of clean water on there, leaving it a little while and lifting it off like this. But it, uh, it's one of those techniques which you can use to build up the, the feeling of the sea. The paintings that you showed us this morning we're all seascapes. Now, obviously, that was because we're painting the yeah. sea today, but that's well, really important I enjoy too. that challenge, yeah. But, mm. I mean, it, it could equally be painting by a stream or a river or a lake. But um, it's just one aspect of my work is painting water and painting it with watercolour. Great. At St Michael's Mount, Kurt showed how to deal with the shoreline by splattering paint. A method I use quite often in a lot of my paintings and a lot of different subjects is a way of applying the paint to the paper without actually touching the surface with a brush. I use it in all sorts of different paintings. For instance, if I was going to try and show the surface of the sea, the wave, waves, the wavelets, the ripples, I might use this technique. So I've put down a layer a wash of light blue. By splattering the paint on the surface, you can start giving the feeling of waves on the surface of the water. Mm. If it's in the wrong place or too dark, you can remove it. If you want to change the shape, do smaller ones. By simply adding less water, you can make smaller marks. By adding more water, mm. you make larger marks. Like this. Yeah. Equally, if I want to 
produce a line, maybe the edge of a wave or a shadow, you can do it like this. It's very effective, isn't it? And if it's in the wrong place, you can simply remove it. Mm. Another place you might use it, today for instance, is if you're working on the beach and you want to show, say, rocks on the sand, seaweed, footsteps, put down an area of the lightest colour on the beach, mm -hmm. add it to the surface. Again, if it's too dark, remove it. Maybe footsteps on the sand. Again, if you want to do a line, say, the edge of a wave hitting the beach, produce it like that. Yes. By using a variety of colours, it allows you to use, at the same time, a variety of marks and can produce a very interesting painting. Does that also produce a kind of callus on that finger if you use it that much? Well, I have sort of built up a, a rough area on this <laughs> finger, but uh, it's not actually painful. And, uh, <laughs> and the other thing is to remember not to sit on that side of well, you when you're painting. that's very true. If you sit there, you'll get paint on you. <laughs> That's really good. Okay. Thank you. Many of Kurt's paintings have great textures in their details of the countryside. At Mapperton Gardens in Dorset, he attacked the foliage with his bare hands. One of the ways of showing this difference between the, the formal and the natural plants is texture and the just the different appearance of the different plants. So I'm looking at uh, a couple of paintings I've got here. This one I did very, very near to here on the way here this morning of a bluebell woodland. Ooh, and this one's closer to where I live on the Scilly Islands. But in both they have basically the same, same problems and uh, I've used same, similar techniques to show this texture of the plants in the foreground. And one of the ways I do it is not to rely on the brush so much, but to use my hands. You might have seen that I have quite long fingernails and uh, they're very important to me as much as the brushes. Like if I was putting down a wash, um, it's a bit blue, but if we were pretending that's quite green. <laughs> For instance, if I was building up textures of grass or these reeds in front of us or something, I can work on it by drawing fingernails and you can either take the colour away, and you've got two things happening there. The pigment collects in the areas where you've sort of engraved into it, yes. but also you can drag through it like this. And so, remove colour. So it's like highlighting leaf shapes. The other thing I do is I use... It's a bit like we were taught at school with finger paintings, by using the flat of your finger like this. For instance, if you had a skyline, maybe in the winter, a line of trees on the, on, the, mm. on the skyline or I mean some of these shapes we have in this garden some of these trees these round bushes distant ones you can use it like that yes. or you can use it more concentrated very neat paint and just as a textural thing you maybe to uh, put over the top of washes you've already put down mm. by building it up and they're, they're just I mean all your fingers have different shapes. Mm. You know, you can build it up and use it in different ways. And in the industrial setting of South Crofty Tin Mine, Kurt wielded a blade to great effect. Instead of using a brush, I use sometimes a razor blade. Right. And sometimes I use it how you'd expect to use it, i.e. for cutting and scraping, which I might show you another day. But today, it's an example of if you're trying to achieve very fine detail in a painting, a sort of a version of drawing, you can literally use a knife to draw with. Mm. Very fine lines. I find this very good because I find it very difficult both to paint with a very fine brush, but also I don't have a very steady hand, <laughs> so I find it quite difficult. And equally, you can lay a colour down and then draw into it with a razor blade. Mm. For instance, if you were doing tips of trees in the winter or dry grass or something, mm. and then if you want, you can remove that 
you get a very no, fine yes. sort of feeling of like an engraving almost. So there we go, another tip for another today. Another tip for today. Thank you very much, Kurt. Okay. I can think of many ways that Kurt's tips can be useful. What can make a braid a painting is what you leave in, what you take out, or even what you move about within the landscape. Just looking at my painting, I feel there's a bit of a gap here, and it may be that just by searching through the sketchbook, because I can't see anything here that I want to include, maybe that I could find in that sketchbook something that could really be of use. Now Susan has got some really useful tips about how to transpose directly from the sketchbook into your painting. We meet her first at High Park Farm in the Lake District. When did you paint this? I painted that about ten days ago when I was on this beach in Ervilla. Mm. Sketchbook is incredibly useful for an artist. It's something that one should use all the time. Any time you've got a few minutes, keep drawing. And you'll find that information completely invaluable when it comes to finishing pictures. It acts as an Abe memoir for all the details that you need. It also acts as a source of inspiration any time when you don't really know quite what to do with your foreground. Mm. Take, a, take a look through your sketchbook and you'll find you've got drawings of stony paths or gorse bushes or sheep or chickens or <laughs> lots of different things. So you're using this to, to fill in the foreground? Well, that's right. I had a slightly empty space, a bit of a boring space. So just to sum up the tip for the day? The tip for the day is use your sketchbook to find information, to store information, and to inspire you when you don't know quite what to do. Thanks a lot. The beautiful Powers Court estate in Wicklow was full of inspiration for Susan's sketchbook. So today I'm looking at painting these figures in. I hope to be able to show drawing them in, but unfortunately we're, we're lacking in figures just at the moment. So we could use the sketchbook. I, I could use my sketchbook information. Which, which always, I have right here. Always on standby. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, a few did pass me by this morning, so I just roughed them into the painting. So I think I'll just work from the drawings that I have, thank right. you. Rather. And some of these are the ones you got this morning. Are people yeah, walking around, right. are they? Yeah, that's right. Mm. So the thing is, just to paint them in very simply, Thank you, Hannah, that's great. OK. So you don't want to put too much narrative detail into them. Now, what does that mean, exactly, narrative detail? Well, narrative detail is things like facial features, you know, mouth, nose, eyes. They'd be distracting at this distance. and they'd What, you'd look at the figures too much, you mean, as opposed to... That's right. So instead of getting the feeling of them moving through the landscape, you get the feeling of them just sort of frozen there as though a photograph had been taken from them. Right. And that's why it's not good to work too much from photographs. That's why your sketchbook is always better, mm. because you get that feeling of movement in the drawing. So I've brought another painting along with me, and it's one where we actually focus in on the um, people. Mm. So in the painting that I've brought along, the figures are the focal point of the picture. Yeah. And in that, you get all the detail that you could possibly want. You can almost see their eyelashes, it's so detailed. But the way that I handle that then is to group the figures together so that they move the eye through the landscape, and the landscape is incidental to the figures. And this, the figures are incidental to the landscape. So you need to keep your people in relation to the subject that you're painting, whether they're the important part of the painting or the minor part, and, and make them work as you wish them to work. Good. That's very helpful. Susan when it comes to the equine race. At Peatlands Park near Amar, she showed how to capture four-legged proportions. So I've decided to make the focal point of this sketch that I've done um, prior to it now, the donkey with the lady riding down the road. And I have the very sketches right here. So here I am with a slightly empty Boglin scene and all I need to do to make it more interesting is to put this donkey in. 
Now, we're actually talking about this little sketch here, aren't we? This little figure and animal. That's right. Yeah. Now, the method that I'm using is to simplify what I'm seeing. So as I look at my sketch there, I can see that the lady who's sitting on the back of the donkey, her back is pretty much a rectangle and the donkey itself is a triangle. Mm -hmm. And then if you look, you'll see that the panniers at the sides are two rectangles. Now, the important thing about this is to make sure that the um, shapes that you're putting in are in proportion to one another, but to simplify them and not to worry about putting too much detail in. Right. And, and you get the feeling of the movement. Yeah. You can actually see this very clearly here, can't you? The rectangle for the body, triangle for the head, a triangular donkey and the two rectangular. That's right. That's tremendously effective. Well, I think I've done just about as much as I can here. I've collected sketchbook drawings, energy sketches, colour notes, and I think I've probably got enough now to be able to take all this back to the studio and have a final look at it there. This is a bit like watercolour challenge. I've got to get this finished before the end of the video. So um, it's going okay so far, but there are a few things that I could I feel I want to change in it. And this is true of us all. There are always things you can do at the last minute just to put those final little finishing touches to it. Susan Webb has got some tips just to show us how. We catch up with her at Brantwood, the final home of John Ruskin in the Lake District. Cast shadows from the clouds are extremely useful to use. It's a device that was used very commonly. Uh, Constable used this a lot. Now, if you want to get a softer edge, you just rinse out your brush and use a bit of clean water and you can blend it back into the landscape. So this is giving the movement through the landscape. Mm. Now, as well as putting your big shadows through the front, you want to run your, th your modelling through the middle distance. So every shape will be casting a shadow from it. The light is coming from the right, so the shadows go to the left. Right. And as you're putting your shadow shapes in, try to make them look interesting, so they're interesting shapes in their own right. And by putting a few shadows onto your cottages in the background, immediately they become three-dimensional. Okay. The tip today is to make use of the cast shadows. Cast shadows flow through our scenery and they give depth and interest to a painting. Place them wherever it suits your composition to have them. Terrific. And in the middle of the golf course at Amar, Susan tackled textures. Texture is variation of surface. This is called dry brush and it's quite a subtle texture. Watercolours are really only suitable for subtle textures because the nature of the medium is to be transparent. This is quite a good one to use on a beach. This one's called honking. It's um, a variation of a technique um, used by Professor Tonks. You lay the tissue onto a wet wash uh -huh. and then you lift it and it gives a particular texture. Watercolour textures are something that are really quite delicate. This one's called stippling and if you take a, a reasonably dampish brush and mm. dip it into some quite thick paint and just dab oh, it on. Wonderful for it, trees. Yeah, brilliant Leaves. for foliage. It's yeah. called stippling. Now if you take a slightly different brush and do the, exactly the same thing you get a different effect because this is a more feathery brush. Bird's feet. Yeah, so it's great, it's great fun to play around with these. Now something that's very useful for skies, so here's the blue sky, put on your wash. Like what we haven't got today. <laughs> that's right. And if you want to do a sky with nice soft, soft clouds, then you take your sponge. I got the sponge. Yeah. Squeeze out your sponge, damp sponge, and just lift it. And you get a really soft edge. You could make that's fluffy lovely. clouds out of that. Now, if you want a harder edge, mm -hmm. so um, fiercer clouds, or you could maybe use it for rocks, you again put another wash on and while it's still wet take a dry tissue and lift off with the tissue and you get a different effect you see that could be a rock texture super again you can apply the paint with your tissue if you want and that gives a different effect 
You could make that into foliage. If you did it in a different colour, you could make it into rocks. Foliage with flowers attached. That's right. If you do the same with a sponge, again, you could use it for foliage. Lots of different effects. Fabulous. They're great fun to play with textures. So just take a few implements, take a bit of paint, take a piece of paper and play. Have a bit of fun. And great. then you can use these textures in your painting. Great. Her last tip from the semi-final at Prinknash Abbey in Gloucestershire is the best advice that any professional artist can give an amateur. Experiment and have fun painting, even if it is with acrylic. This is a warning. Some of you at home may be deeply shocked by today's parting tip. Susan Mary Webb's about to be impure. Me? Impure? No. Not at all. <laughs> What's she going to do? Well, I'm, I'm, I love to play with my watercolours, and uh, some people think that pure watercolour should be pure watercolour, and you should never do anything else but be pure with it. Right. And I like playing with other um, media in with the watercolour, and I see no harm in that. Right. And so what I'm going to talk about is mixed media and show you some wonderful things that you can do with that. This is a painting um, that's already begun. Here uh -huh. it is. It's a painting that's already got a wash on it. It's got a, 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 a nice bit of white plastered on with a bit of palette knife. Uh -huh. And then you just take a little bit of, of darker wash and you wash that back over it. And you see it gives you this really nice textured effect. And when that dries, it'll look just like a rock. Great. If you want to use your same palette knife to give you the effect of scree on a mountain side, take a pre-prepared mountain and <laughs> just drag your knife over it. Now, unfortunately, that got a little bit of wet on it, so we'll try it again. And it really ought to stay dry. And you just drag the mountain across, and you see how it just catches on the little right. bits of raised paper. Yes, that's and great. And what did you say? White stuff was that you were using? Well, uh, you can use any white paint, white just gouache white paint, paint or, mm. or acrylic paint, depends on who you wish to be. Let's <laughs> see. Carry on. Uh, no. Next one we're going to show is uh, wax resisting. You see, shove a great big bit of wax onto a pre-prepared background. Mm -hmm. So this could be a boggy foreground or a bit of broken um, grassland, anything that you like. Now, I want a little bit of earth to show through it, so mm -hmm. I've, I've painted in an ochre brown background, and here comes the green over it, and you see it gives a nice broken effect. Here's mm -hmm. one that I prepared earlier, and it's dry. <laughs> so after you've got the, it dry, then mm -hmm. you can uh, put some ink on it if you want. Right. So here goes some ink. So you could draw grasses into it, or since I like to go painting in the bogs, you could put some bog cuts into it. But knowing I'm going to put mixed media on it gives me a great deal of freedom, and I do it with much more pizzazz, <laughs> and it's great fun to try. So my message for the final tip is have fun with your paints and try anything. I warned you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Well, I put my paints away, but the question is always there, is this painting finished or not? There's always decisions to be made, always work to be done. So one way of having a look, certainly with watercolour, is to pick up a couple of these L-shaped mounts and just see whether that composition is exactly as you intended it to be, or whether possibly there are more intriguing little compositions. I think I'll stick as I am, and I'll just try this more permanent mount around it, just to have a look because it does tend to show up the good points and the bad points. I, I do think perhaps I could have made this slightly warmer here. But as Hannah would say, time's up, and I think you're going to have to be the judge of whether we're there or not with that one. Anyway, goodbye, and really enjoy your painting. And if you enjoy painting in watercolour, why not join the Watercolour Challenge Club? Members receive a quarterly magazine packed with more handy hints as well as special offers on books and discounted admissions to galleries and exhibitions. To join or get further information, please call 0870-2424-848 or write to the Watercolour Challenge Club, PO Box 7000, Cardiff, CF5 2YU. Thank you.